Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, a section on robotics. I mean, the, the section on robotics of the afternoon. And uh, we start immediately with the presentation as it is uh, usual for this uh, conference. We have a 15 minute presentation and then five minutes for questions. We have to stay uh, precise on time, but uh, we will do that. I immediately introduced the first speaker of, of the session and uh, the, the person giving the first talk is uh, Assad uh, uh, Shahid and the title of the presentation is learning continuous control actions from for robotic uh, grasping with reinforcement learning. Please uh, Assad, I leave you the floor. Thank you. So I'm going to share the screen now. I hope everybody can see my screen. All right. So thanks for the introduction. My name is Asad Ali Shahid. And uh, uh, the title of my talk is going to be Learning Continu Continuous Control Actions for Robotic Grasping with Reinforcement Learning. So this work has been done with Loris Roveda and Dario Piga from uh, Itzia in Lugano. So I'll begin with uh, a brief motivation about the topic. So these are the modern state-of-the-art robots operating in a highly structured settings and executing very repetitive motions. However, these robots cannot deal with unexpected situations and they demand manual adjustment whenever such situations arise. On the other hand, the dream of the robotics is to have uh, robots that can operate in unstructured environments and that are also able to adapt to uh, unexpected situations of the environment. So for the modern robots, the common approach implies having a custom built robot hardware and then expert is programming every single action of the robot. And then the robot executes a very fixed and special purpose behavior as long as the conditions remain fixed. On the other hand, the robots tomorrow are required, are increasingly required to have uh, a general purpose robots are required to demonstrate adaptive and general purpose behavior, especially in the industry 4.0 scenarios. So how can we bridge this gap between having general purpose robotic hardware and having a adaptive and general purpose behavior from them? So in particular, machine learning approaches give us a way to bridge this gap and enable intelligent robots. Therefore, the main research goal of this work has been to investigate and propose a learning-based methodology for a robot to be able to learn and perform an industrial manipulation task. So the task considered in this work is a grasping task, uh, which requires the robot to approach the part and then grasp it and then finally lift it off the contact surface. So I will start with the brief uh, uh, limitations about state of the art. Then I'll give an overview of the proposed approach uh, before presenting the design of the reward function for two different scenarios for the baseline task completion and then for the retraining scenario with embedded performance specifications. And finally, I will present the comparison of two different algorithms before concluding with the experimental results. So how can we make a robot learn a new skill? So it turns out one kind of approach is to simply have a human demonstrate the behavior. So these approaches are called learning from demonstrations. But the problem with these approaches is they struggle to learn the task in case of imperfect demonstrations. And in order to learn in the high dimensional settings, too many demonstrations are required but still they show very limited generalization capability. The second kind of approach is to give a reward. So these kind of approaches are classified as reinforcement learning approaches. Uh, in fact, reinforcement learning approaches have shown quite a nice success in uh, uh, complex games, but they learn with very high experience. And the presence of continuous state and action spaces in robotics further complicates the application of uh, reinforcement learning. And it remains a big open question to how, how to reuse the prior knowledge and how to learn the task faster in the new settings when the task has been changed. So recently there have been some attempts to improve the sam sample efficiency of uh, reinforcement learning approaches. For example, by learning local time varying linear dynamics models, uh, like in the first picture here. But this kind of approach works in the easy regions of the state space without uh, any discontinuities and with very smooth dynamics. Uh, another idea is to have a large scale data collection, for example, in the other two pictures, uh, to either learn uh, continuous control actions 
through self-supervised learning or through model-free reinforcement learning without learning any kind of uh, dynamical model of the system. But this kind of data collection requires enormous resources and it's not really economically feasible. So in contrast, in this work, we try to learn the control policy through simulated experience without relying on any real world data and without relying on any human demonstrations. And we learn the task completely in the model free settings. So without learning any dynamical model of the system. And then the learned behavior is finally transferred to the real robot to execute the target task. And furthermore, the idea of transfer learning has been borrowed from the application of neural networks in the other uh, fields. And the weights of the neural networks are transferred in order to learn the task faster when the task setting has been changed. So the approach consists of two main components. We have an agent and an environment. So the agent interacts with an environment in discrete steps and samples the state of the environment. So in response to this state, the agent decides to perform an action and receives a reward. So in the agent block here, we can see that there are three main blocks. So in the policy improvement phase, uh, the, the main objective of the agent is to learn a policy. So policy is a conditional probability distribution of actions over states. And in the policy improvement block, uh, the optimization objective of uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm is applied. Uh, to learn the policy, uh, to, to change the parameters of the neural network and two modern reinforcement learning algorithms are used. So first one is on policy algorithm, proximal policy optimization. And second one is off policy reinforcement learning algorithm called soft actor critic. So in the policy evaluation phase, uh, the value function of the corresponding policy is computed uh, by uh, computing the value function and then this uh, value function is used to guide the policy improvement phase. So in the replay buffer, the past data is stored. And then for the proximal policy optimization algorithm, the replay buffer is cleared because it's a non-policy algorithm and it uses the most recent experience to learn the task. Whereas for the soft actor critic algorithm, the replay buffer is used, all the data is stored. So the action from the agent consists of joint actions and the gripper actions, which go into the controller. Uh, and that is then finally executed onto the robot in the simulation. And the state space of the system consists of two more main input modalities. So the robot proprioceptive information and the object centric state. And the action space consists of uh, joint actions uh, corresponding to the seven degrees of freedom of the, of the robot arm. And then the gripper joint positions, uh, which is mirrored to have a symmetrical action for both the left and right fingers of the gripper. So that's the total dimension of the action space is eight and for the state space is 46. Then finally, the uh, actions are going into the controller, which converts them into the desire uh, to the talks. Uh, so the actions are interpreted as desired joint velocities. And then by applying fixed proportional gains, they're converted into the learned talks. So the proportional gains are considered tuned in this uh, in this setting. So for after several iterations of the task, uh, the design, uh, the reward function has been uh, designed. So the, the task consists of two main phases, reaching phase and the grasping and lifting phase combined into the one. For the reaching phase, the, the reward is composed of three main contribution, uh, distance reward, velocity reward, and the gripper reward. And for the grasping and lifting phase, it's composed of five contributions uh, with the additional contributions of grasping and success in order to understand if the robot is actually grasping the part and if the, if the robot has successfully completed the task, which means holding the part above uh, a certain height. So here we can see the learning process in action. At the beginning, when the neural networks parameters are initialized randomly, we can see that the actions are all over the place. But then just after um, 1 million steps of training, we can see that the learning algorithm uh, monotonically learns to improve the reward function. And then the robot uh, gets closer and closer to the task completion. So approximately after 3 million steps, we can see it's, uh, the robot is already learning to, to grasp the part, which is a cube in this, uh, in this setting. And so we train the policy approximately for 10 million steps uh, to, to give a more possibility to have a success for higher number of steps. 
So finally, after learning the desired behavior, uh, we test two different uh, performance scenarios. So in the first table here in the top, uh, the part position is fixed. So, but uh, there are different parts which are considered. So nominal cube was used for training and the other shapes were never shown, but we can see here the success rate is uh, reported in 10 out of 10 trials, 100% success rate is reported. In the second case, in the second table, the position of the part of the cube has been, or the robot has been modified. So in the first case, we add a little bit of random noise to the joint positions of the robot. And still we see that 80% of the time and the robot is able to successfully execute the task. And in case of second uh, test, the cube position has been modified uh, and uh, out of 10 trials, seven trials have been resulted in success. Uh, and in the last case, we signify, significantly modify the position, original position of the, of the part. And then we retrain uh, by fine tuning the previously uh, learned bits of the neural networks. And then after around 30 minutes of uh, retraining, we can see that the success rate of again 100% is achieved. So here we can see in the video that the robot is actually learning to grasp the, is actually showing successfully grasping the screwdriver, which was never uh, shown in the training phase. So then in the second part, we apply the idea of transfer learning by fine tuning the previously learned model. Uh, and specifically we reuse all the weights and we fine tune them by changing the task. So in the first case, we include the redundancy, the redundancy management uh, objective, where the purpose is not to have a robot taking actions close to the joint limits. In the second case, uh, the purpose is to have a, uh, avoid jerky behavior. In the last case, uh, the purpose is to, have, to avoid collisions with the obstacles that are present in the scene. And uh, penalties are included successively into the reward function. So here for the first case, we can see that the baseline model was uh, completing the task, but going close to the joint limits around 35% of the time. But after retraining with the previously learned uh, model, we can see that uh, the, uh, the robot adopts the behavior and avoids taking actions close to the joint limits. So for the second case here, we can see that there are two different curves. So the blue curve corresponds to when the acceleration penalty is included uh, to smooth the control actions. And in case of orange curve, it corresponds to the baseline scenario when there was no acceleration penalty. So we can see that the blue curve, in case of blue curve, the learn torques. So this corresponds to a learn torque for seven joints. The learn torques are much more smoother for the blue curve than it is for the orange curve. And then finally, this is the third case results where we modify the scene with the two different cylindrical obstacles. So here you just saw that the robot was colliding with one of the obstacles, but after we retrain, uh, we fine tune the previously learned weights and we retrain for one hour and we can see that robot adopts the behavior and not to go to the joint limit. So this was the first one where the robot was colliding with the obstacle. Finally, we perform the comparison of uh, two different uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So one is proximal policy optimization, which is on policy. And the second one is soft actor critic, which is off policy. So in fact, soft actor critic is a uh, off policy algorithm, which means it stores the previous data into a replay buffer. So according to a hypothesis, it should learn the task in less experience. So indeed, uh, confirming the hypothesis here, we can see two different graphs of uh, accumulated reward, mean accumulated reward, and the mean success rate. So in fact, uh, soft actor critic learns the task faster and just in 2 million steps of training, it shows the success rate. Whereas uh, the proximal policy optimization doesn't really show any success after 2 million steps of uh, training. But if you look at these graphs, the results are actually quite opposite. So since soft actor critic algorithm is actually has to process large amount of data that is stored into the replay buffer, it actually learns the task slower. So here we see the blue curve corresponds to the proximal policy optimization and proximal policy optimization algorithm has learned to accumulate higher reward than the soft actor critic algorithm when it is plotted against wall clock time. So it's around two hours and 30 minutes of time of training. And we can see uh, proximal policy optimization learns uh, to accumulate higher reward and also learns to show success for more number of uh, time steps. 
and it makes sense because uh, uh, we consider the same computation hardware so uh, a standard laptop with one gpu and a uh, uh, few cpus so it needs much more compute power in case of soft actor uh, critic algorithm so finally we perform the experimental validation on a real franca mika panda robot which was used uh, in the simulation also to to train the task so in this case for the real robot uh, the joint positions are resampled from the 500 hertz which is the simulation frequency and to 1000 hertz which is the real robot's uh, control frequency and then the joint positions are extracted from the simulation and executed onto the real robot and we can actually see here in the video that the robot is able to successfully execute the task so in fact here the cube doesn't uh, correspond exactly to the cube that was used during the training but it's uh, quite similar it's a little bit different dimensions but we have changed the dimensions in the simulation before extracting the joint positions so to conclude uh, in this work we have uh, further advanced the state of the art by formulating task learning as reinforcement learning problem and learning the grasping task in simulation then finally the idea of transfer learning has been uh, used in order to adapt the behavior previously learned behavior on partially new settings and then the task oriented reward function has been designed which uh, not only incorporates the success of the task but also additional performance objectives and the comparison of uh, learning performance across on policy and off policy algorithms has been shown so thank you for your attention and i'd be happy to take your questions thank you very much i don't see if questions in in the chat at the moment i don't see if someone has uh, you can uh, i didn't i didn't tell at the beginning but you can write your name in the chat or just uh, write i want to ask a question and uh, and uh, we will be able to give you voice uh, you can uh, ask a question directly in the chat i mean uh, directly uh, live um I, I wait for a moment for some questions. In the meantime, while waiting, I, I ask you uh, a clarification. So you mentioned the, the concept of uh, transfer learning. Uh, so you are working in simulation and then uh, uh, going to perform directly the experiment uh, uh, after the training in simulation, if I understood correctly, uh, I mean live in, in the lab with a real robot. Uh, can you uh, find some way to um, I mean, quantify, let me say, the guarantee that you have that this transfer learning mechanism works well? So uh, the way of quantification is actually uh, for, the for the baseline task, it took uh, around, uh, around four hours to train it right from the scratch. When we just initialize the parameters of the neural network randomly, so we have two neural networks, the policy network, and the uh, and the value network but instead when we reuse the prior learned weights it takes maximum one hour of retraining in order to basically uh, successfully complete the target task which has been changed in all different scenarios so in the first case like i showed here that it was uh, the task was not only to lift the cube but lift the cube uh, which was placed on the table, but also avoid going close to the joint limits. So in this case, in the first two cases, it took around 30 minutes of training, whereas uh, training from the scratch, it took around four hours. And in the last case, it took around one hour of free training and training from the scratch, we haven't done it for the last case. Okay, so my question was more on, let's say, formal guarantee so it, i mean there is uh, i suppose i i don't know exactly but i imagine that it's not easy to predict which is the advantage that you have thanks to this uh, uh, transfer learning in the reduction of the learning uh, time or is uh, it correct i think it would be interesting to quantify it more on the objective basis so basically trying to understand how the reward changes uh, so we have more uh, identified more on the qualitative basis uh, so basically just comparing the time it took while learning from scratch and how much time it took while reusing the prior uh, prior knowledge and sharing the weights but i think it would be more interesting to maybe quantify on a more objective basis by actually computing the 
comparing the how much uh, actually comparing the reward and also I think the task success. So for instance, in the first case, when we train from scratch, how long does it take and how the progression of the reward goes. And for example, then uh, it would also be interesting to evaluate then what is the performance at the end and then compare to the second case when the prior parameters are reused for the transfer learning. Very good. Thank you so much, Hassad. Uh, we are running out of time, so I, I need to skip to the next speaker. Thank you for your presentation. I, 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 I make some noise for all the, the attendees and uh, I move on the next to present the next speaker, who is uh, one of my PhD students, by the way. Uh, she's Bianca San Giovanni, and Bianca is going to present our paper about reinforcement learning based on motion planning and obstacle avoidance for robot manipulators. Thank Please you. Bianca? Yes, I will uh, share the screen right now. Let's see. Okay, you should see the presentation. Can you see my screen, right? Yes. I, I, I hope that everyone is able to see it. I see. It. Okay, so I can start. Please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Bianca San Giovanni, and I am a PhD student at the University of Pavia. And today I will illustrate the research we have been doing uh, uh, on using deep reinforcement learning applied to, rob to industrial manipulator to perform motion planning and obstacle avoidance. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Professor Ferrara, who is my advisor, uh, Professor Gianpaolo Cremona from the Politecnico di Milano, and uh, my the master student I've been tutoring, which is uh, Nicola Sacchi. So, uh, Robotics applications nowadays are becoming more and more common and, as such, there is an increasing need for robots to be able to interact with the surrounding environment. Because of this, safety must be enforced in order to avoid damages or people getting hurt. To this end, collision avoidance is one of the most important problems in this field of research. Collision avoidance is the prevention of undesired, potentially dangerous contacts between humans and robots or robots and other machines. Typically, collision avoidance is uh, performed, uh, let's say, very simplified in three steps. Uh, one is the perception of the environment. The second one uh, is uh, the application of a given collision avoidance algorithm that uh, gives out the instruction that the robot should follow to avoid or uh, detect or recover from a collision, and then the actual low-level robot control. Several uh, methodologies have been proposed in the literature to solve uh, this problem. However, it remains a very complex problem still, because uh, not every time we can have uh, an accurate enough uh, uh, dynamical model of the robot, for example, to perform a low level design of the controller, or uh, we don't have an accurate enough uh, um, model of the environment to perform an online trajectory planning. Nevertheless, uh, in the recent years, a lot of focus has been put on reinforcement learning as an approach to control in an end-to-end end-to-end model-free manner very complex uh, uh, systems that are difficult to hard engineer. The way reinforcement learning works, uh, uh, an agent, in this case a robot, for example, uh, continuously interacts with the environment to autonomously discover the best strategy to perform a task upon receiving rewards. So the main elements uh, of the reinforcement learning framework are uh, the states or observation, which is the set of environment variables that we can observe directly. Uh, they generally come from sensor data, such as encoders or cameras. Then we have the actions, which is uh, what the agent can do to interact with the environment. And typically, this is uh, the output of the policy that we are training with reinforcement learning. Then there is the reward, which is a function which should be representative enough of the task we, we need to accomplish, and it gives a feedback on how well the agent has done at a certain step during training. The overall goal of reinforcement learning is to maximize the uh, cumulative long-term long uh, reward in order to find the best policy. However, uh, some problem may arise when dealing with very large systems with uh, continuous state spaces and action spaces, uh, which become infeasibly large to tackle uh, with conventional learning approaches. One way to solve this uh, is uh, to use approximators with deep neural networks to substitute, let's say, the function that are involved with training. Uh, thus, the name uh, deep reinforcement learning. 
So coming back to the collision avoidance problem, uh, we decided to recast the collision avoidance problem um, into the re uh, reinforcement learning framework, especially uh, focusing uh, on a six degrees of freedom industrial manipulator that you can see here. Uh, the task that, you want to, that we want to, uh, to accomplish can be divided into two components. One is to reach a pre-specified target in space uh, that you can see in the picture as the little green dot, in the, which is placed in the operative space. And at the same time, we want to avoid the collision with unexpected obstacles that are invading the robot's workspace. Uh, the state space that we decided to adopt is composed by the current joint position and velocities, uh, the target position that we want to reach, the end factor position at a given time, and then the obstacles position and velocities. All this information uh, are sampled every 50 milliseconds in our framework uh, and uh, our episodes, uh, one episode of training uh, has a fixed length of uh, 18 seconds. The action space then uh, is uh, the joint velocity reference for the next step. So given the information we have about the, the, um, the state space, uh, the algorithm computes uh, the velocity at which the joints uh, should rotate. In this case, we have all the revolute joints. The reward function then was the designed as a weighted sum of three terms. You can see that they are negative terms, so it really is a penalty function. So our goal is to steer it as close as possible to zero. The components are a term that accounts for the distance between the end effector and the target point and is designed as a Huber loss function. Then we have a regularization term which regulates the magnitude of the actions, so to limit uh, let's say, larger actions and uh, incentivate uh, smaller actions uh, at each given time step. This, uh, let's say, uh, reduces the action uh, that uh, the robot uh, has to perform uh, every time. Then uh, the last one is the term that accounts uh, for the distance between the robot and the obstacle. So it's the collision avoidance term, uh, which is uh, designed as uh, this uh, kind of function where the reference uh, is a fixed, is a constant term that uh, uh, avoids that this function uh, uh, gets divided by zero. The minimum distance uh, between the robot and the obstacle uh, is, uh, compute, is uh, retrieved directly by the simulator that we are using, but can be generally estimated uh, with, uh, with camera sensors. In the picture that you see here uh, on the right, uh, uh, as this is, uh, let's say, the, how the reward function works if the robot moves uh, as a point agent. So for each, uh, considering that we have a target placed uh, on the blue arrow and an obstacle, a round obstacle uh, placed uh, at that point, if uh, the agent moves in that point, uh, it, you can see that is a, there is a big hole in the reward, meaning that it receives a very big penalty, while the reward goes up to zero uh, when it's close to the target. So um, start, uh, we designed uh, uh, three different training scenarios uh, with increasing complexity. The first one is, uh, this is in order to train the robot to perform collision avoidance. The first one is very simple, is where uh, uh, the target is uh, kept fixed during uh, all the training and uh, the, the obstacle actually moves uh, in a linear manner. So along a straight line uh, uh, crossing uh, the, um, the operative space of, uh, of the robot. The second scenario, the target is still kept fixed during all the training, but instead the obstacle no longer moves on a straight line, but moves planarly, so along two directions. The third one is uh, we have still the obstacle that moves in a planar way, so along two directions, but instead the target is randomly initiated uh, at the beginning of each episode during the training. So training for the last scenario, we decided to use uh, uh, the previously gained experience from the simple one and uh, reuse uh, in different ways uh, what we learn in previous training for the, let's say, the most complex one. Transfer learning has been, uh, this is generally uh, addressed as transfer learning, and it has been performed in two ways. One is model transfer, where uh, we reused the learned parameters of the action values function and the initializer of uh, uh, the neural network. And the second one is experience transfer, where we reuse the content of the replay buffer uh, that we filled uh, during the training. So the replay buffer is a stack of um, the quadruplets that determine state, action, reward, and next state uh, for each step of the training. 
So for scenario three, we tried uh, both kinds of uh, transfer learning, and uh, we observed that uh, we gained an overall better performance. Uh, this is a training for uh, 550 uh, episodes. And uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, experience transfer showed uh, the best improvement. So uh, generally, it uh, learns a strategy in less episodes uh, and performs uh, overall, uh, um, overall better. Uh, the algorithm that was used for training uh, is uh, the normalized advantage function, which is an advantage actor, actor critic uh, algorithm uh, that was presented by Gu et al. in 2017. And it introduced an algorithm uh, that is particularly suitable for continuous uh, state and action spaces. So it's particularly efficient uh, for uh, robotic application. We questioned uh, the efficacy of end-to-end -end control. So indeed, end-to-end -end control uh, using deep reinforcement learning can be very helpful to give a natural description uh, to problems that are hard to hand engineer and is, in general, very adaptable to different scenarios. However, with limited resources, it entails very long training times, and even with good domain randomization, unexpected or undesirable behavior can happen due to the uh, casual uh, nature of the, of the policy. Nevertheless, uh, uh, simulation to real can be difficult uh, in, uh, in several situations. A proposed solution that we came up to is uh, then to combine different methods and switch between conventional planning and control methods and the ERL based one, depending on the task we are prioritizing at a given moment. So for this specific case, uh, the dual strategy that we propose uh, works like this. First, we compute a trajectory in the operative space uh, to reach a target point without accounting for obstacles. So we use a conventional motion plan planning method without considering any obstacle in the environment to reach a point in space. If, uh, while moving along the path, uh, a risk of collision is detected, uh, we switch the control uh, to the policy uh, that was trained uh, with deep reinforcement learning. Once the risk uh, has expired, so once uh, mm, our uh, a risk assessment tells us that we are no longer at risk of collision. Uh, we recompute then uh, the, the motion planning from the current configuration and we recover the motion to the target. So this is a short video I prepared to show you how our agent works with the, the different strategies. So what you are seeing now is uh, performing the task using end-to-end -end strategy. So we are entirely controlling the robot with the deep reinforcement learning. And as you can see, although the task is performed satisfactory, uh, you can see that the position of the end effector uh, is still influenced by the motion of the obstacle. And nevertheless, uh, uh, collision avoidance is performed, uh, in my opinion, really well because uh, no collision happen and it, uh, the robot is uh, very prompt to move uh, when, the, when the obstacle is nearby. So these were different uh, target positions. And this is instead the hybrid dual mode strategy. So the motion planning and deep learning combined. So you see that this pink line is uh, the path computed by the planner. And uh, the green dot you can see on the left uh, indicates when it's purple, we are using a cl classical controller, while when it's green, uh, we are enforcing deep reinforcement learning. As you can see, the robot is uh, as expected much more stable on the target while still performing a, a satisfactory avoidance. And this one was for the first, for the third target. All right. So the performance of both methods has been validated this way. So we studied uh, some uh, indicators. One that account, which is the failure rate, uh, which is uh, the number of collision uh, over the whole training episode, so over the, uh, the, the, the episode duration. So uh, this is measured, the number of collision is measured as the number of samples in which the, the measured distance between the obstacle and the robot was measured zero, and t is the, the overall number of steps in an episode. And uh, the reaching precision indicator is the root mean square value of um, the distance between the target and the end effector. So uh, in the heat maps that you see here, each square, each little square is uh, a position of the target in uh, the operative space of the robot. And uh, 
in this case, on the left, we have the failure rate, and the failure rate is averaged for each position uh, over three, 30 episodes. So for each square, we perform a, a simulation, a 30 simulation. We average the number uh, of collisions, so the failure rate, and uh, we iterate for all the position of the targets. And in the same way on the left uh, for the reaching precision for uh, each uh, dot of the heat map, uh, the value is actually the average of 30 simulators. So we have uh, uh, X position, Y position uh, uh, 30 times. As you can see, uh, both methods, uh, the, both the end-to-end, -end, which is in the first row, and the hybrid method, which is the second row, they, they have uh, comparable results in terms of uh, failure rate. So actually, the hybrid one performs a little bit better, while uh, uh, the performance in terms of reaching has greatly improved uh, while using uh, uh, the hybrid one, as we expected. Additional scenarios have been studied when uh, trying to test these uh, this approach, and we actually use the same framework to train uh, the agent to avoid obstacles that move in a special manner. So we have 3D motion this time. And of course, as you can see, it is shape independent. So we no longer have a sphere, we have a general shape, and the obstacle moves in 3D. And this one, instead, we added another obstacle to the observation space, and you can see that still it manages to avoid both obstacles and perform reaching once the risk of collision has expired. Oh, sorry. All right. Another indicator of uh, how it performs uh, is given by uh, the tracked distance between uh, the obstacles and uh, the distance between the end effector and the target. As you can see, we are in this case, uh, in this case, we have two obstacles. And as you can see, in the end to end control, uh, so full end-to-end -end control, we can see that although the target, the, the, the agent manages, tries to maintain its, the distance between the end effector and the target low, it is still very much influenced by uh, the constant present, presence of uh, two obstacles moving the operative space. On the other hand, uh, using the hybrid strategy, we can see that uh, the distance is zero whenever the risk uh, is uh, is low, so uh, the end effector maintains uh, clearly on the target. And uh, you can see that whenever uh, the, each of the obstacles comes too close, so be, below a threshold, it enforces the reinforcement learning policy. And you can see that it moves away from, um, from the obstacle and from the target, of course, to avoid collision. In this case, the threshold was uh, 16 centimeters. Some future developments for this project uh, involve improving uh, uh, the training and deploy on more complex industrial scenarios. Uh, we uh, want to, we are working now to try and deploy it on an actual industrial manipulator, so not a collaborative one, but an actual proprietary uh, industrial manipulator, which is an Epson VTC that you can see represented in, uh, in the picture and design more sophisticated scenario-based switching strategy between uh, different approaches. So no longer just motion planning and end-to-end, -end, but several collision avoidance methods, uh, motion planning methods, uh, and so on and so forth for industrial tasks. So uh, we are uh, looking forward to application to industrial case studies uh, and possibly more. If you are interested in the works, the works we, uh, we, we published uh, on, on this uh, research, are uh, two papers. So one is Deep Reinforcement Learning for Collision Avoidance of Robot Manipulator, with, uh, uh, in which we introduced the end-to-end -end strategy for collision avoidance, which was presented in at the European Control Conference in 2018 and is published in the proceedings. And the second one that we just uh, that was just accepted uh, in the control system letters and will be presented at this CTC, uh, which is um, set configuring trouble to pulp planning with obstacle avoidance, uh, we had deep reinforcement learning, which is uh, basically uh, the beginning of uh, what you said during this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. And please, if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bianca. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, a bit uh, Short of. Uh, I'm sorry, time, I but probably went don't worry. Long. We have one minute. I don't see question in the chat. Um, I, I just ask you a comment about uh, still about the transfer learning today. I am a yes. bit <laughs> uh, influenced, but it's very thing. interesting. <laughs> yes, I, I was mentioning. I was thinking uh, if you ever notice some uh, uh, dependence of the experiments uh, uh, on the transfer learning. So I mean, 
Is it possible to conceive a sort of design of the experiments used for training in order to improve the capability of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the entire setting to, in terms of transfer learning, so improve the capability of transferring the learning? Oh, a kind of, in the meaning that, uh, um, of course, I, for the best of my knowledge, the task has to be, of course, similar. So as you see, uh, the task is basically the same, but uh, um, it has increasing complexity. Uh, what would be interesting to see is uh, actually doing different trainings for different aspects and then combining uh, all of them for a, a different task. So, for example, training one agent for just collision avoidance, training one agent just for, let's say, grasping or uh, tracking or spot welding, for example, and then find a way to combine all of this. Uh, so, basically, we train for this with different frameworks and then find a way to combine all of this uh, into a more general settings. Uh, so, what I think it it is tricky because uh, then you need to readapt the framework, but it certainly is interesting. I think uh, I believe there are some research lines on this. Thank you very much, Bianca. Very nice uh, reply. We have to go on with the discussion on this point in the lab. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Maybe next week. Of, absolutely. <laughs> thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. I will interrupt. Uh, thank you. I will interrupt my sharing. Yes. Thank you, Bianca. Some an applause. From, uh, from the audience, on behalf of the, of the audience, uh, I go on uh, with uh, the introduction of the speakers. Uh, so we are now at the third presentation of the session. The next speaker is Gabriele Costante. Uh, Gabriele will uh, present the paper which is entitled Towards Data-Driven Visual Odometry from Model-Based to Deep Learning Approaches. Please, Gabriele, you have uh, the, the floor. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to um, start the presentation. Yes, so uh, again, thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. I'm Gabriele Costante from the Intelligent System and Automation Robotics Laboratory from the Department of Engineering of the University of Perugia. And today I'm going to present our research activity on visual odometry, in particular, our investigation about data-driven approaches as a viable alternative to model-based approaches for visual odometry. So uh, visual odometry is a very important um, building block of each robot localization system. Uh, it basically uh, aims to estimate the robot echo motion uh, by processing pair of consecutive images. This is very important because um, it requires only a very cheap and lightweight uh, camera sensor, which is uh, um, very important in those situations where other where there are uh, very tight constraints regarding the weight and the power consumption. So in those uh, cases where you cannot use, for example, lidar sensor, radar, or uh, laser sensors. And uh, it is crucial, for example, in GPS denied environments, so indoor scenarios like the one in the video on the right, which is an, an, um, an industrial facility. And it is also very important where you cannot rely upon uh, wheel encoders. So for example, UAVs or underwater vehicles. Mm, so in the literature, uh, visual dominance is, is usually solved by following two fundamental paradigms. The first one is, our, is the model-based one, which is also referred to as uh, geometric approaches. And it basically uh, is, is based on a well-defined model that describes how the visual features are transformed across consecutive frames. So by tracking and extracting those features, we can estimate the uh, robot ego motion, which is the platform attached to the vision sensor, of course. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have data-driven approaches. In this case, we, uh, we assume that the model is unknown and we aim to uh, learn that model by performing uh, superv supervised or unsupervised learning uh, through neural network, for example. Uh, geometric approaches are, um, have been and, I, and they still are the state of the art for visual, visual odometry. There are a lot of uh, um, very, very popular works that are used both uh, in for industrial applications and for commercial products. Some of them are, released, are listed in these slides. Uh, however, geometric approaches have some weaknesses. Uh, one of them is related to the fact that we need to 
um, requ we, need, we require a very um, precise parameter tuning and camera intrinsic estimation. So even, even a slight uh, uh, miss um, estimations of a focal length, for example, could lead to a critical failure. And on the other hand, they also suffer when the image conditions are non-ideal, which is very common in real world applications. So for example, when the motion blur is too heavy or when the image brightness is too high or too low. And also in all those contexts where the textures uh, are low. So for example, when uh, there are no visual cues in the image, the objects are nearly absent or we face nearly flat walls, for example. Uh, to address these issues, um, we started to consider also data-driven approaches. So deep learning and also a convolutional neural network uh, are, um, uh, their use is widespread nowadays in many different robotic applications, including, for example, obstacle detection and avoidance, uh, planning, uh, even visual geometry, of course, and also automation uh, applications such as process, estimate, process, model, uh, process estimations. So for visual odometry, we, we rely on convolutional neural network. We try we investigated their potentialities because convolutional neural network are known to be very robust to extract features even in those conditions where the images are far from the ideal uh, condition. So following these intuitions, we uh, proposed three in, in the last years, we proposed three different approaches. The first one is CNN VO, then we improved it by uh, proposing a less VO. And lastly, we propose uncertainty aware visual odometry, which basically bridge the gaps, the gap between the model based and the data driven approaches by estimating, by proposing a way to estimate the uncertainty associated to the point estimate of the network. This way we can use this uncertainty to perform fusion and take the best of both worlds between geometric and data-driven approaches. So I'm going to start with our first work, which is CNN VO. In this case, this was our pioneer work in this direction. And we were among the first to propose a data-driven alternative to visual odometry estimation. In this case, we devised an architecture based on convolutional neural network to process pair of images. Uh, which are then fed to a standard neural network, which uh, provides uh, the ego motion estimation of the robot. Uh, we consider both RGB and optical flow images as the inputs, and we, are, we were actually able to prove that in this way we were more robust with respect to the geometrical approaches in those situations where the images are not in there. Um, afterwards, we improved this approach in our uh, second contribution, which is LSVO. So in this case, we dealt with the problem of generalization. Uh, neural networks suffer a well-known problem of the overfitting with respect to the uh, scenario they, they have been trained with respect to. So uh, for example, in the visual odometry case, uh, if uh, we uh, train the network by using a, a sequence gathered by a car, which uh, drives at a certain speed, and then we uh, try to use this model during the inference phase on uh, another context where the car is faster or slower with respect to the one used during training, we will experience um, uh, a wrong estimation of the trajectory. And in particular, we will overestimate or underestimate the scale of the trajectory, for example. So to try to address this problem, we uh, proposed a multitask architecture that forces the network to learn motion primitives and to use these motion primitives to provide more robust uh, um, estimations and to be able to generalize over different kinds of scenarios. So the network is a multi-branch network. The, the upper branch is very similar to our previous work. In this case, this branch is still responsible for the estimation of the, um, um, the estimation of the uh, of the motion of the robot, while the lower branch is responsible to reconstruct the optical flow. And by forcing these reconstructions, we are able to uh, force the layer in the orange box to estimate the motion primitives that can be used then by the prediction block to perform the estimation. We optimize this uh, um, this network with respect to two losses. The first one, which is the lower one, is still the uh, supervision loss, which accounts for the difference between the estimated quantity and the ground truth one, while the, um, the uppermost uh, loss is responsible to account for the optical flow reconstruction, and hence it drives the motion primitive 
primitive learning process. Uh, these losses are, as always, learned through backpropagation procedures as common for neural networks. Finally, we, um, we address the problem of estimating the uncertainty for this kind of network. Estimating the uncertainty is crucial uh, in many different kinds of application of robotic application. For example, if you consider autonomous driving, um, if the, um, the car relies upon uh, an, ob an obstacle detection model to understand if there is a need for braking or not, uh, you can understand that uh, having a confidence measure measurement about the uh, obstacle de de detection output is crucial because if the confidence is very low, then the supervision system might decide to break regardless of the obstacle detection output because, for example, with a confidence of 10%, then there is a high chance that the prediction will be wrong. So for, to prevent a fatal crash, in that case, we can use that confidence to take action. In the visual autonomy case, on the other hand, we can use these uncertainty estimations to perform fusion. So to use, for example, Kalman filter in fusion and fuse the measurement with that, uh, from data-driven approaches with other approaches. In our case, we consider model-based geometrical approaches to take the best of both worlds. And this is also because geometric approaches are very precise in ideal conditions. And in that case, we should rely upon them. On the other hand, data-driven approaches can be used when the uncertainty of the geometrical approaches rises. And in this case, we can use data-driven one to still guarantee reliable performance, even in, in, uh, in more challenging situations. So to, to this aim, we considered, uh, we need, of course, uh, to estimate this uncertainty, but first we need to differentiate between two kinds of uncertainties. One is the epistemic one, and uh, the other one is the aleatoric one. Epistemic uncertainty accounts for the model that the uncertainty that the, that the model has with respect to its parameters and basically tells us how much the model is certain about inputs that it has not observed during training. And it can be reduced by simply augmenting the training data set and showing the network a wide variety of possible input scenarios. On the other hand, the aleatoric uncertainty encodes the intrinsic noise of the input. So for example, a white image will always have a high uncertainty, regardless of, of how many white images the network has observed during training, because it, it doesn't carry any information, so it cannot be used to perform estimation. The aleatoric uncertainty can be heterostatic, which means that it can be input dependent, of course. So to estimate this uncertainty, um, uh, usually we need to estimate the full predictive posterior distribution. And to do so, we need to marginalize over all possible models conditioned on the data set. Unfortunately, this kind of operation requires to estimate the posterior distribution, which is the P of W given X and Y. Uh, which in the case of neural network, uh, we use, uh, in, um, the mean of this distribution is estimated through an, a highly nonlinear function. And for this reason, the, uh, this problem is usually analytically intractable. Hence, we need to uh, rely upon different approaches. In particular, usually we rely on approximate inference. And in this work, we propose to use dropout variational inference. This kind of techniques uh, basically requires to add dropout layers at different uh, stages of the network. And by keeping active these layers during the inference phase, we can uh, ask the network to perform multiple forward passes of the input. And at each passes, the network will randomly drop, drop some connection. And it can be shown that in this way, you can uh, estimate by sampling the posterior distribution, which is proven to be a Gaussian, and hence, we can easily compute the variance by, um, by following these uh, Monte Carlo sampling approaches. And with the variance, then we can uh, have a measurement of the confidence that the network has with respect to its point estimate, which is, in this case, the mean of the Gaussian. Uh, regarding the aleatoric uncertainty, on the other hand, we need to explicitly ask the network to predict it as a, another output of the network. And in particular, we modified the loss functions to account for this kind of uncertainty. So um, to this aim, we propose an architecture which is com composed by three fundamental blocks. The green one extracts the fissures by processing sequences of images. 
The orange one is a recurrent block which model temporal depend dependencies between uh, different time steps. And the blue one is the prediction block, which outputs both the point estimate, which is the robot transformation between different frames, and the aleatoric uncertainty. By performing multiple forward passes of the same input, we can also account for the epistemic uncertainty. By combining both, both of them, we can estimate um, both of the uncertainty. The loss function, which we optimized, is again composed by two parts. The first part, which is in this case is the quaternion and the translational part of the, um, of the error with respect to the ground truth, which again, it compares the prediction of the network with respect to the supervision signals. And then we have this part in the exponentials, which accounts for the um, aleatoric uncertainty. Again, this loss is optimized Having estimated the uncertainty, we can then perform fusion. So uh, we can fuse both the data-driven the and the um, geometrical approaches. We, um, we used a, a standard Kalman filtering approach in this case, where the covariances of the measurement of date are computed for the data-driven counterpart by following the method we, I, I just presented before. For the geometrical counterpart, we uh, use some heuristics suggested by the authors of the uh, respective papers. Mm, we um, tested, we evaluated our approach in different um, pub publicly available data set for automotive, also for aerial vehicles. And we also tested our approach in a real world, um, in a real robot uh, within our lab. Uh, we, our the, the error metrics are basically the translational and the rotational error of the trajectories. And we actually were able to show that uh, with our approach, so by combining geometrical and data-driven approaches with our strategy, we can achieve, achieve the top performance with respect to the two methods taken by themselves, so in standalone, and also with respect to other state-of-the-art data-driven and geometrical approaches. So to summarize, in this line of research, we investigated and explored the role of data-driven approaches as an alternative to model-based model one for visual odometry. And with our last work, we actually uh, bridged the gap between those two, two, those two words. So by proposing a strategy to take the best of the, the geometric approaches and the data-driven approaches for visual odometry. In future works, we will focus on the generalization issues, which are still problematic for data-driven approaches in particular, and we will also try to propose a tighter coupling between the model-based and the data-driven strategy. So proposing, for example, hybrid architectures or hybrid approaches in general. And with this, I concluded and thank you again. And I would be very happy to answer to a few questions, if any. Thank you very much, Gabriele. We have three minutes for question. If uh, anyone wants want to ask a question, just write your name in the chat and uh, we will be able to, to give you the possibility of asking the question. I wait for a moment to see if someone wants to ask something. Well, I don't want to inhibit anyone. But in the meantime, I, I, I just ask a curiosity I have. Uh, Think of uh, combining your approach with, uh, let's say, our approach. I mean, uh, a, a, a control approach in which we, we use uh, also learning, uh, deep reinforcement learning to control the robots. So we assume that we, we mixed a, a, a kind of uh, deep learning based uh, odometry and uh, a uh, deep reinforcement based control. Which kind of guarantee do you think we can provide? So. Uh, are we running some risk in using this combination of uh, two uh, not so well certified, at least up to now, approaches? Do you have an idea? Of course, it's a very provocative uh, question, Mark. My, I, my think, question. I think it's a very important topic. Actually, we are also um, uh, working on deeper enforcement learning uh, with um, another, another PhD student of mine. So um, and actually we are exploring uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning even for visual odometry. So deep reinforcement learning is more end-to-end -end in the sense that we go, we could go directly from the input to the action. Um, 
estimating the uncertainty is a problem even for estimation network as uh, I showed. Uh, this uh, strategy uh, I just presented is, um, is important. In the, in, of course, there are a lot of works in this direction, not only, not only mine, because it guarantees that the uncertainty that it is estimated is actually very close to the real one, because there are some mathematical proofs. And I'm quite sure that we can use this strategy to also extend to deep reinforcement learning as, so, uh, as long as we use the, um, deep networks, because these... Uh, uh, results holds for uh, deep architecture because uh, it is proven to be that deep networks uh, can be associated to Gaussian processes and then we can uh, have some measurement of confidence. So yes, the answer I think it's yes, but mm, there is still some uh, road to uh, to do to, uh, to move this kind of strategy also to deep reinforcement learning because the, the problem is, as you said, more complex in that case. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, well, again, I, I just thank make you. some noise uh, on behalf of all the audience. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, at this point, I go on and I introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Manuel Beschi. Manuel will uh, present uh, a talk about uh, uh, IRR. Sorry, I am moving. I'm losing the chat. I was reading the title, but someone happens. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find again the title. Hierarchical QP trajectory scaling with limited joint excursion. Good afternoon. Is, Can you hear me? Right? Yours. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm Manuel Beskin from the Industrial Control System Group of the University of Brescia. I present a, a contribution with other two co-authors that are uh, Marco Faroni and Nicola Pedrocchi from the SIMA Institute of the National Research Council. And the, the contribution is about an algorithm to solve a hierarchical quadratic problem considering a, a limited joint excursion. The, the input of the problem is a, a Cartesian path that can be uh, undefined, for instance, because uh, um, we don't need any information about some rotation of some uh, axis or something similar. For instance, if uh, we, have, uh, we are performing a service robotic and we have to carry uh, a staff to uh, a person, in this case, the position is not important, but it's important to, have, uh, to keep the orientation correctly in order to don't uh, throw out the, the coffee in this case. Okay, so we have this undefined uh, Cartesian path. This undefined Cartesian path uh, has, can be computed in different ways. It's not important. The only requirement that, that we have to, uh, to, to respect is that the Cartesian path is, is collision free. After that, we have to uh, apply a time parameterization to this uh, Cartesian path. The time, parameterization, time parameterization is not so important, so it can, uh, we can the, the time parameterization could uh, violate the joint limit because it's just to having a, nom a nominal time that we use as a curvilinear abscissa. We apply uh, this, uh, the problem to our redundant robot with respect to the selective task, and this redundant robot has some uh, constraints on the joint speed and acceleration. During this, uh, the performance, the, during this uh, task, we need to, we want to uh, satisfy also secondary goals, such as uh, maximize the distance with respect to the humans, for, for example. And we have to respect some limitation on the joint distortion in order to avoid collision with the rest of the, of the environment. The output of the uh, algorithm will be a joint trajectory that uh, uh, respect to the geometrical path and, uh, and, the, joint, uh, and uh, the joint limit. And uh, moreover, when it, when it is possible, try to minimize the secondary goal. Okay. In literature, this, uh, problem, this class of problem are uh, often uh, solved as a minimization problem in the velo joint velocity space when we select the joint velocity in order to follow the Cartesian path and to uh, minimize a list of uh, uh, goals in, uh, in our ordinary way. So the primary goal, the secondary goal, and so on. Since the nominal trajectory could be unfeasible, this problem uh, 
also could be unfeasible. So it, it is necessary to add a, uh, an additional decision variable that is the uh, task scaling uh, variable S. The variable S is uh, uh, working a very simple way. If X is equal to one, we have following the nominal trajectory. If S is less than one, we have to go down the nominal trajectory in order to uh, satisfy uh, the journey. This uh, scaling is also, can be also used as a, in, in the normal algorithm here in the algorithm that I show, we try to keep this uh, variable the scaling uh, variable close to one, but we can uh, change uh, from one to another value considering the distance with, with respect to the human and the, and the robot. So in this way, we can uh, also integrate the ISO standard on, on uh, collaborative robot in industrial scenario simply by adding this uh, new uh, reference for the velocity of the controller inside the, the algorithm. Okay. This uh, class of uh, minimization problems could be solved in, the, in several ways. One of the most common in literature is the one step solver, where the minimization is uh, uh, solved just for the actual uh, time instant. This is uh, this kind of algorithm are very fast, but they are the solution is very far from the optimal solution, so uh, they lack in uh, optimality. Another possibility is to optimize the entire uh, over the entire trajectory, the, the cost function. But in this case, uh, the solution is, is optimal, but the computational time is very high. And our goal in this case is to uh, achieve uh, more uh, around one kilohertz of uh, Break uh, for the for our algorithm, so we need to be very fast. In uh, for uh, overcoming this problem, in a in a journal of um, in the transactional robotics, we propose the using a receding horizon uh, approach, such as in the predictive control, but we are applied in the, the trajectory tracking, where we move the prediction window during the during the execution of the trajectory, and we. Uh, uh, propose a way to linearize the problem in order to solve it, not the optimal problem, but a, but a suboptimal problem, but to be able to solve it in a very in a faster way. It's worth stressing that uh, the proposed algorithm is a, a fit for control, so it fits the, the internal position controller with the set point uh, of the trajectory, so it doesn't affect the stability of the the inner position loop, uh, and we can apply it to a uh, industrial robot without uh, without issue. Okay, one idea on the linearization: the linearization uh, on the previous estimation is a very say, simple uh, algorithm. We take the last pre available prediction and we linearize with this, this trend, uh, the Jacobian and the other uh, nonlinear term in the optimization. In this way, we obtain a quadratic problem with a uh, uh, linear constraint, and we can uh, solve it in a very, in some, uh, in less than one millisecond normally, in a normal laptop, and this way we can obtain a new prediction uh, uh, that we, it will be used in the next step for the next iteration, the linearization. In order to achieve this uh, performance in the solution of the uh, uh, quadratic problem, we don't use the uniform sampling, but we use uh, not uniform sampling. And we show that uh, uh, it's enough to have a three to five uh, uh, time instance inside the prediction window to obtain a good performance. If we increase more, we use more than five time instance during the prediction window, the performance are more or less the same. So uh, there is no need to, to use too many variables in the problem. Okay, what is the problem with this, uh, this approach? The problem is that when we are using the, a robot in a very complex uh, scenario, for instance, in industrial cell, where there is some, uh, a lot of collision objects around the, the robot, for instance, the robot is inside a cage or there is some barrier uh, that we have to avoid. If we allow the robot to completely reorientate, uh, exploiting the redundancy to satisfy the secondary goals, we have a very, we obtain a very different trajectory with respect to the nominal one. So in, in this video, now, uh, uh, in some seconds, we will see the, the planet trajectory, which is a collision-free trajectory, this one in, the, in a shadow form. And then the robot starts to execute the trajectory. But since in this application, the secondary goal is to keep the, uh, the robot elbow far from the human workspace, 
the trajectory is completely shifted and we have a collision. So we need to uh, limit the uh, reorientation of the robot in order to uh, keep the to avoid the collision with the environment. So we uh, modify the algorithm and inter algorithm introducing two uh, other mechanisms. One is a control-based approach to change the weight of the uh, hierarchical uh, problem in order to prioritize or the satisfaction of the secondary goal or the, the, the need to limit the joint exclusion. And then we introduce an art constraint that is a sort of tube around the nominal trajectory. So we have the nominal trajectory, we add a tube around the nominal trajectory and we want to solve the problem only around this tube to limit the, uh, the discussion. But in this case, we have to uh, cope with problem feasibility because we need to ensure that the, the problem is feasible also with, with the addition of these uh, constraints. Considering the first term, uh, the, the basic idea is quite, uh, quite easy. We have a, a controller that uh, uh, select uh, the, the weight uh, of the secondary goal in order, in order to balance the secondary goal with respect to the need of keeping the, the robot close to the nominal trajectory. And in particular, when the robot is coming close to the boundary of the tube, we are uh, changing the weight of the, uh, of the secondary goal in order to uh, switch uh, uh, from uh, one goal to the other goal. This is a, a simple idea that allows to, to, to obtain good performance, but is not our constraint. So we cannot ensure that the robot stay inside the tube. In order to ensure in this, uh, this aspect, we have also to add an, uh, an additional constraint, our constraints on the tube. But when we add some constraints on the tube, we have to uh, check if the, the, the system still feasible and if what are the conditions to, to guarantee this feasibility. Feasibility. In the uh, paper that we present in IROS uh, 2020 and in the robotic automation letter, we demonstrated that using a, a task scaling variable S uh, is uh, always possible to have a is always possible to, to guarantee uh, the feasibility of the problem if uh, the position and the velocity of the joint belongs to a, a viable set. So having uh, uh, this condition, we can ensure that uh, the system is able to perform uh, all the, to find a, a proper solution. In order to guarantee that uh, the, the position and the velocity still uh, in, uh, remain in a viable set, we have to define a model for the, the evolution of the position and the velocity. In this case, we consider only kinematic constraints, so constraints on position, velocity, and acceleration. And so we can, we can model the the joints as a double integrator, the input is the acceleration, and the output are the velocity and the position. For this kind of, uh, of kinematic uh, model, uh, it's well known that the viable set is as a quadratic, uh, quadratic shape. So we cannot apply this uh, viable set uh, in, a, in, a linear, in a quadratic problem with a linear constraint. And uh, since we want to keep the, the solver uh, simple to, uh, to a CP1 millisecond, we, uh, we don't use the maximum viable set, but we use a, a smaller viable set, which is a, poly, a polygon uh, viable set, and we derive a, a method to find in a, in a closed form, which is the maximum uh, viable set for a given number of polygons. So if we, need, if we approximate the, the quadratic uh, uh, set with a, a polygon with three segments, we can obtain with how to put the, the points of the polygon in order to maximize the viability for this uh, specific uh, uh, set. Here is an example, a simulation example. Uh, there is a ticket place attack in, uh, in, uh, with uh, a cell with some obstacle in, uh, around. And we can see that, we can see that uh, in, the, uh, in the first graph, uh, the, the red one, there is the, the results with the standard IK which uh, doesn't guarantee the, to stay inside the tube. In fact, uh, in, uh, in fact the joint exclusion is, uh, is bigger than the, the maximum value. Then in the middle uh, uh, graph, in the, graph in the center, we have only the weight regulation. So we change the priority to, from state inside the, the tube and uh, satisfy the secondary goal. And in general, the performance are good, but there are some uh, uh, violation of the constraints. And finally, considering 
the viable constraints and the weight regulation, we are able to ensure the, uh, the respect of the, the constraints and also uh, having a, a good result. We also implement uh, the algorithm in a human robot collaboration uh, scenario when the robot and two operators have to pick uh, and place, uh, pick and place uh, uh, some object in a shared workspace. So the robot has to pick some object and the operator has to pick up their object. The goal of the, the robot, uh, one, um, one secondary goal is to keep the robot as far as possible from the, uh, from the operator. Another uh, goal that is prioritized, uh, is a priority, is to respect uh, the, the ISO standards so we slow down the robot if uh, the, the operator is, is uh, uh, if we cannot change the position of the robot and uh, the operator is, is too close. And uh, in this case, uh, we don't have a video because then the lockdown is set with the possible recording of the video. Uh, but um, it, it's possible to see the, the performance of the, the algorithm that is able to keep the uh, the joint exclusion inside the, the boundary. So summarizing, we propose an algorithm to solve a universe kinematic uh, problem for a redundant manipulator in order to limit the joint uh, exclusion. That is a, a crucial aspect uh, when we are working in a very complex uh, cell and so there are too many, too many obstacles and we have to uh, stay close to uh, the nominal trajectory in order to avoid collision. Uh, in this case of problem, in adding these constraints uh, uh, is not trivial because we need to cope with uh, uh, the viable uh, the viable set and to ensure feasibility. And then, in order to have uh, performances of the algorithm and the good results, we also add a, a regulation of the uh, hierarchical problem weight in order to prioritize one task instead of the other one, depending on the position of the of, of the robot inside the the, the tube. Uh, I, with this, I complete my explanation. I thank you, Big Place Project, for uh, funding, uh, for partially funding this project. And I, I, if anyone has questions, I, I will ask uh, and we will enjoy your question. Thank you very much, Manuel. Let's see if uh, someone wants to, uh, to ask a question live. Let's wait for a moment uh, just to avoid it to steal the time of someone else. I don't see in the, in the chat. Well, I, I have a curiosity. I, I noticed that you, you mentioned a very simple model for the joints, uh, double integrator or, uh, and something like that. Um, I, I was wondering how the, the possibility of having a, a, a rather uh, uncertain model, I mean, if uh, identification is not uh, performed well, or it, it is not easy because uh, for, for the kind of robot you are mentioning, it's not so easy to identify a very precise model. At least this is my experience. Uh, I was wondering how uh, uncertainty on the model of, uh, of the joint can influence the compliance with the limits of the uh, viability uh, the viability set. Yes, these are a, a good question because uh, let me say for the moment we, in this case we consider only velocity and acceleration in the uh, as, as limit. But the acceleration limit is not a real limit for the robot. The, the, the real uh, constraints on the robot are velocity and torque. So the, the need of a uh, uh, dynamical model to estimate the torque is, is uh, an improvement. From one side, we keep it simple because it's, uh, our uh, uh, algorithm is uh, providing the fit forward to the inter internal position loop. So we don't need to have uh, to close the loop. So in this case, uh, the, Closing the loop, the model will be crucial. In this case, is uh, is less crucial, but the we have to pay the price that we have to pay because of this uh, simple model is that uh, the acceleration limit is keep uh, small. So, in principle, in some position, the acceleration limit could be increased because, the, for instance, in this movement, the gravity acts uh, as a, in a positive way, so we can accelerate faster. But we have to to cut the, the acceleration limit in order to be sure that the, then the internal robot is, is able to follow the, the control. 
We propose also, not in this uh, hierarchical problem, we propose a modification of the ceiling horizon approach, approach also to keeping into account the thought limit. That is a, a, a nice, uh, nice idea. However, the, the computational uh, burden increases a bit. So in this case, we are able to stay below, below one millisecond, considering also the torque that requires additional computation and so on. Uh, we stay in some in few milliseconds that for the universal robot that is running at eight milliseconds as a computational period is, is okay, but for other robots, maybe it's not the, the computational velocity is not enough. But for sure, it's a, it's a, a, a nice, uh, nice uh, research area to improve the, our algorithm considering also uncertainty in the model. Very well, thank you very much for uh, your very clear. Uh, very clear reply. I think uh, we are uh, perfectly on time to move on and introduce the last speaker of the session, who is Alessandro Freddi. Alessandro is going to present, uh, present uh, to give a talk about a Twitter for the tolerant control of variable pitch quadrilateral vehicles. I, I miss uh, again the chat. Oh, sorry for that and uh, uh, vehicles and well the title is is that and uh, uh, please Alessandro uh, the floor is yours yes thank you very much can you hear me and uh, uh, see the presentation I, I hear you and I see I hope that everybody okay is. so thank you again I'm Alessandro Freddi from uh, Università Politecnica delle Marche Today, I am presenting to you our research activity on uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and more in detail, uh, uh, our recent result on uh, fault tolerant control of variable pitch quadrilateral vehicles, which were discussed during uh, the latest uh, IFAC 2020 World Congress. Uh, variable pitch quadrilaterals can vary the rotational speed of each motor. And uh, in this regard, they are similar to standard fixed pitch quadrotors, but they differ from uh, the classical quadrotor since they can also vary the blade pitch, namely the angle of attack of the blades. And this provides for several advantages, uh, like higher thrust rate of change. They have uh, reverse flight capabilities and more especially they scale well with size. From the control point of view, since they share the same rigid body dynamics, uh, a control load designed for fixed pitch quadrotor can be seamlessly adapted to work with uh, variable pitch quadrotors. The difference lies in the control allocation level. Indeed, variable pitch quadrotors are overactuated system which have eight inputs, so we have some degrees of freedom which can be exploited to deal with additional constraints. For instance, uh, in uh, our research activity, we want to use uh, these uh, degrees of freedom to cope with actuator faults or failures. More in detail, we consider two types uh, of problems which may happen on the variable pitch quadrotor, and the problems are the loss of effectiveness fault, namely the producer thrust is reduced with respect to the commanded or decided one and this means that we have a, a problem at the rotor system or the lock in place failure so the blade pitch becomes stuck and cannot be changed anymore and this is due to a problem at the servo motor so the objective of our research in detail is to solve the attitude tracking problem for a variable pitch quadrotor which is subject to both loss of effectiveness faults and lock-in-place failures. And the proposed scheme is the one as follows. Uh, we will focus uh, in this presentation on the blue block, namely the fault detection and diagnosis, and on the allocation block, which is the gray one here. Please note that in our scheme, the fault is uh, estimated and provided to the allocation block which provides fault tolerant capabilities at the allocation level. So any control load nominally designed for a variable or fixed pitch quadrotor can be employed. Here is the outline of the presentation. I will start quickly by introducing the models. Then I will describe the core of the presentation, namely the fault detection and diagnosis system and the accommodation, namely the feedback to the control allocation algorithm. 
I will provide some simulation results and end the presentation with conclusions and future works. As for the models, as I've already said before, uh, the main body dynamics uh, of the variable pitch quadrotor is very similar to fixed pitch one. So the classical equations are uh, here. Phi theta and psi represent the roll pitch and yaw angle. P, Q, and R are the instantaneous rotational speeds along the coordinated body axis. Z is the altitude. Uh, UF is the upward lift force. UP, UQ, and UR are the torques around the coordinated body axis. Uh, we can rewrite the model in a more compact form by introducing the uh, eta one vector state variable, which includes Z, theta, uh, theta and psi, and the uh, vector virtual input U, UF, UP, UQ, and UR. The difference between uh, variable and fixed pitch becomes instead evident when we go into the input mapping relationship. Here, by looking at the trust, first row, and the torque, second row, we can see that they depend on the rotational speed of the motor, omega i, as in the fixed pitch quadrotor. But in this case, the lift and drag coefficients are not constant, but they are dependent on the input variable alpha i. And this makes a big difference when dealing with the control allocation algorithm. By making some aerodynamical assumptions, we can end up with the approximated input mapping you can see at the bottom of the slide. On the left side, we have the virtual inputs, namely the inputs which are used to design the control law. And on the right, we can see the nonlinear mapping, which includes variables omega, alpha, and we have also introduced these parameters wi, which maps uh, uh, trust loss effects. Nominally, it is equal to one, but when a fault happens to the system, it becomes less than one, uh, typically from zero to one. Now that we have the mapping, we can exploit it to derive the control allocation. Uh, as you can see here, it is very similar to the fixed quadrotor vehicle. Please note that last uh, row, however, is uh, not constant because uh, it depends on the angle alpha i. We performed a polynomial approximation uh, and so ended up with uh, this new uh, variable b, b inverted hat, uh, which correspond to this matrix where cl and cd have been uh, approximated with a polynomial approximation. Uh, in this case, even if it is not constant, at each time stamp it is numerical and this helps us when dealing with the control allocation problem. So the control allocation problem has been simply formulated as a quadratic program problem where we want to find uh, the trust which minimize the energy consumption under the model uh, equality constraint. So BT is equal to the virtual input provided by the control law and under the inequality constraints. Namely, we want the total trust to be uh, saturated by a maximum and a minimum value. Trust constraints, pitch angle, and rotational speed constraints uh, are uh, defined here. Please note that for our approach to work, we need two uh, information. The first one is the estimation of the parameters WI, which I repeat, uh, maps the information of trust loss, so namely fault. Second, we need the information about possible stuck angle. So if one of the servo motor becomes stuck, we must estimate and provide this estimation to the control allocation in order for our approach to work. So the optimization problem has been technically solved using the weighted least squares method, which is an active set method based on the following relaxed problem. For the reminder of the presentation, uh, we will use uh, three different uh, U virtual input variable, namely UN, which is the output of the controller, the ideal one, UAL, where AL stands for allocated, which is the output of the control allocation algorithm, and U, which is the actual input, so the one provided by the actuators. Please note that UN, UAL, and U may differ because of the previous approximation because of the constraints and more in detail because a fault or a failure may happen to the system. 
So let us move now to the fault detection and diagnosis uh, and how to exploit the information provided by this module for accommodation. As uh, you can recall, uh, we need to estimate the parameters W and we have to estimate the stack angle alpha. To do that, we designed a fault detection and diagnosis module uh, based uh, on the model and on this following heuristic. First, we want to observe the input, actual input, u, and we have this u hat. By knowing u hat, we estimate the thrust loss estimation, w hat and t hat. If the thrust loss estimation is big, namely a big thrust loss is happening into our system, we may have two possible scenarios. The first one, we have an abrupt loss of effectiveness. The second one is we have a lock-in-place failure. So in the first case, we have a problem in the motor system. In the second case, we have a problem at the servo system. We isolate the motor which is experiencing the fault. And finally, we provide the estimation of the stack angle if a lock-in-place failure has been detected. So let's start with the first step, the input observer. We have designed the input observer by using the so-called disturbance or server-based control framework. So we design an observer of this form where we use the auxiliary variable S which wants to estimate delta u, which is the difference between the allocated u and the actual u, uh, which is additioned by a lambda function. This lambda function depends on the system state, is differentiable, and it, we can see that if we choose it to be of this form, here reported in the slide, I will uh, skip the mathematical detail to keep it fast, uh, we can show that the observation error is ultimately bound. Once the observer has been designed, we know delta u hat, we know u r because it is the output of the previous allocation step, and then we can estimate the actual input. From this, we can estimate the actual thrust, and from the actual thrust, we can finally estimate the thrust loss parameter. So the first part of our procedure is complete. Now, what we want to check is if we have a big uh, thrust loss in our estimation. So we consider a residual variable, which is defined as the difference between the allocated thrust and the estimated one. This variable is filtered and checked against an adaptive threshold. If uh, the filtered variable is below threshold, then no severe fault is happening. Simply the estimation of WI is provided to the control allocation and the control allocation is solved. If the severe fault is uh, uh, detected, namely the filtered residual goes above threshold, then we want to understand if there has been a, a servo lock in place. To do that, we need to uh, perform the so-called active fault diagnosis. Namely, we need to inject an auxiliary input uh, at the right time in order to improve the quality of the decision. Unfortunately, since the uh, abrupt loss of effectiveness and lock in place both affect the same channel in similar ways, we cannot rely on passive methods. So we must have the active fault diagnosis. In our case, the trigger is the detection of a severe fault. And the idea is the following. When the eighth rotor is uh, uh, flagged to be uh, uh, experiencing a severe fault, the corresponding uh, alpha allocate is, uh, is forced to decrease. You can prove that the difference between the actual trust and the allocated one differs according to the type of fault. In detail, in case of abrupt love of effectiveness, this difference is negative. In case of lock in place, this difference is positive. So this is again a new residual with a check against a zero threshold to understand if you are in the first case abrupt the loft of effectiveness, or in the second one, a lock in place, namely a problem at the servo motor. Finally, if we understand we are in the second case, uh, we want to estimate the angle of stack. We have four equations in one variable, if you recall to the input mapping equations. 
we substitute wi with its estimation, we substitute omega i with the allocated one, we substitute uh, the coefficient of lift uh, with its polynomial uh, approximation, calculated at the allocation level. Finally, we discard uh, the equation regarding the drag, which is affected more by noise, and we find CL simply as a least square solution. Finally, by using some aerodynamic approximation, we can estimate the stack angle, which is fed back to the control allocation to solve the quadratic programming under saturation constraints. So, let's now move to some uh, simulation results. Uh, we perform simulation uh, uh, scenarios of two types, one the A-type uh, quantitative, the other one the B-type qualitative. In the quantitative scenario, we perform 100 simulation. In 50 of them, we injected a, a servo failure uh, randomly at a time interval between 1 and 15. In the other 15 simulation, we injected a loss of effectiveness uh, with uh, the ramp-like profile you can see in the picture on the right uh, upper side of this slide. Uh, by using our proposed scheme, in case of servo failure, we succeeded to perform trajectory tracking 48 times out of 50, and in case of loss of effectiveness, 42 times out of 50. Please note that the nominal classical control law without fault allocation uh, can never succeed in performing trajectory tracking in case of the considered faults. And if we estimate the fault, but we do not discriminate between servo and loss of effectiveness, only 19 times out of 50, the trajectory was uh, followed. And simulation uh, type B, instead, we performed a singular simulation where we injected gradually a loss of effectiveness at t equal to 5 seconds, a lock in place at t equal to 10 seconds, and finally, an abrupt loss of effectiveness at t 15 seconds. Here you can see the altitude tracking performances on the z variable. Here you can see the orientation tracking performances at the yo variable. And here you can see the attitude tracking performances of roll and pitch. Please note that despite the reference being quite demanding for the dynamics of a quadrotal vehicle, the tracking is rather good. And even when the fault happens, the error becomes small after a short period of time. Finally, you can see here the estimation of the trust loss. So here the estimation of the first fault, here the estimation of the third fault, which are mapped on loss of effectiveness. In the second and third case, so respectively violet and blue line, you can see the threshold is crossed. And in this case, the active fault diagnosis paradigm was successfully activated. Summing up, we have proposed a control scheme for variable pitch quadrotors to cope with two kinds of actuator faults, namely lock-in-place failure, pitch servo, and loss of effectiveness for the rotor system. Uh, the model-based approach uh, performs uh, input observation, fault estimation, active fault diagnosis, uh, and control allocation reconfiguration. Simulation results have shown uh, that the proposed solution uh, is effective, uh, but we have some possible issues since uh, not 100% of the time our solution can manage uh, a fault. So as future work, uh, we would like to experimentally validate the proposed solution. We would like to shorten the uh, active fault diagnosis time in order to improve uh, the performances and to reduce the decision time. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, please ask me. Thank you very much. Let's see if we have uh, some questions in the chat. I see that uh, Alessandro Pisano uh, has a question. I think that uh, Alessandro can yes. be enabled. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Please, okay. Alessandro. Hello, Antonella. <laughs> uh, um, can you first resume which uh, parameters should be known in order to implement the fault estimation strategy, I mean inertial or friction parameter, and then uh, did you estimate how sensitive the fault identification method is against uh, some uh, uncertainty in the knowledge of the parameters? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, the observer is uh, designed using uh, these uh, dynamics. 
So we assume that the states uh, are observed. So Z, Phi, Theta, and Psi must be measured. Um, and obviously we have to know the mass, the gravitational constant, and the inertia of the vehicle. So these are the, uh, all the measurements that must be available and all the parameters which must be available. Uh, also the scale parameters, the... KRP, KRQ, what, they, what do they represent? Yes, uh, KRP, KRQ, and KRR are uh, uh, friction parameters in this case, uh, which are usually not well known. Uh, you can design the observer also ignoring these parameters, uh, but obviously you have uh, some uh, error when you do that. We are, um, you, in order to design the observer, uh, these uh, parameters uh, must be known, but we have not performed so far a sensitive analysis. Uh, so we have not checked uh, how sensitive is our observation error when this parameter differ from the nominal one. I think, yes, it will be meaningful to make some simulation considering some uh, mismatch <coughs> between the actual and nominal values, especially of the friction parameters. Yeah, in previous works, we made some uh, uh, analysis, but in this particular case with variable pitch, uh, we focused uh, on the allocation problem. So we didn't merge the two things. So it is uh, one thing we are going to do in, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much to all the attendees uh, for uh, their participation in this section. We have uh, finished. I only uh, invite you to join uh, all the other people uh, in the virtual Poeto Beach, as you have read in the chat. And then I invite you to attend uh, the, the single track section on gender balance and other issues related to gender um, at uh, a quarter past five. And uh, well, I hope to see you there. Bye bye, everyone. We are finished. Thank you. Bye.